the order of discovery significantly affects what happens next in the world of science. So before we get to Darwin and his theory of evolution, it's important for us to discuss the things that came before him. When talking about any important discovery, it's also important to talk about what came immediately prior. When we're talking about evolution, there's a couple things that we want to discuss. First, essentialism, philosophy from ancient Greece. But also there's some key insights that people notice repeatedly over a couple hundreds of years. And lastly, some important discoveries and people who influenced Darwin himself. But let's start with essentialism. The idea we're thinking about here is that context is everything. The order of discoveries and inventions will affect what is discovered later, because most of science is influenced by what we have already noticed. And also, non-scientific assumptions also affect science. Think about what the church did to poor Galileo. But right now, let's talk about how philosophy influenced biology. Right here, we're talking about essentialism. This is an idea that started with Plato and Aristotle, so it goes back to these ancient Greek philosophers. This starts with the word eidos, which means idea or archetype. This is the idea that there is a perfect archetype of everything somewhere in an alternate plane. There's a perfect chair. There's a perfect table. And each chair we see in our world today is an imperfect realization of that perfect archetype. Every chair you see, you'll notice, is a little bit different. But under this idea, you can ignore all of those differences because it's just an imperfect realization of this perfect chair. We can also call this typological thinking because you are thinking in distinct types. This is sometimes described through the allegory of a cave. So in this cave here, we have a big fire behind us and we have a couple people chained to a wall looking at another wall. It's uh, not a great life. And you can see there's another set of people here who are just like holding stuff up and casting shadows on the wall. So the people that are chained there, all they get to experience of the world is these shadows on the wall. Well, this is not a particularly pleasant metaphor. Um, the idea here is to showcase that these people only get to um, experience the fuzzy outlines and only have a vague idea of what they're actually looking at. And th this was their way of saying that, well, we really don't have a way to experience these perfect archetypes and that everything we see in our world has many imperfections. When we bring this to real species, let's look at three pictures of Carlito Sarecta, the Philippine Tarsier. You can see there are some definite similarities. They're all cute. They all have big eyes, tiny noses, and kind of long spindly fingers. But you might notice some differences. One has a little bit larger eyes. One has, you know, more yellowy eyes. Others are more brown. One has much darker eyes. No slight differences in the color of their fur. If you are looking at these different pictures from the lens of essentialism, you would say these imperfections don't matter because they're simply imperfections of the same perfect species. Other uh, consequences of this viewpoint are the idea of discontinuities between types. So each species is distinct and that there is no linkage between them. Take this even further and now you have something called the immutability of species, that species are static and cannot change. So if you have these ideas in mind, that means species cannot be changed by natural forces. So all of this came from Aristotle and Plato, and this was before the, the Judeo-Christian tradition um, took Europe by storm. Um, but once the Judeo-Christian tradition was thoroughly entrenched in Europe, this came to have a slightly different form. Um, it eventually was put into something called the Scala Naturae, or the Great Chain of Being. So now we are taking all of life and explicitly putting it into a hierarchical ladder. This is one of the um, historical pictures of it, but it's a little bit hard to interpret. So let's look at a more modern rendition. You can see at the top we have God, then we have angels, demons, then man, animals, plants, minerals. So even on the Scala Naturae, we're including things that aren't real and are also inanimate. So this is, um, it is an attempt at classification and it, I think it tells us a little bit about humans. We like to classify things and put things in order, but we haven't quite separated out the fact that living creatures are distinct and different at this point. 
So to bring it back, essentialism, we call it typological thinking because we're thinking in distinct different types. And it was the status quo for hundreds of years. And that meant it was an incredibly powerful assumption to overcome. So when we're talking about evolution, don't forget to think about essentialism because this is what Darwin had to disprove and go up against when he was um, proposing his theory. So can you explain what is essentialism and why does it matter?